All right, there we go. Good evening, everybody. This is Jeff Colson, Junior Hockey Advisor. It is Wednesday. It's 9 o'clock. It's time to talk hockey and talk about some great things. I want to thank you for joining us and jumping in. And it's been a few great weeks. We've seen just incredible numbers of people watching the videos, and we appreciate it. Um, I'm running solo tonight. Uh, Mike has uh, had a little sadness in his family. Our thoughts and prayers are with Mike and his family. And uh, I hope he'll be back next week and uh, everything will start getting back to normal for all of us. And it's that time of year. So I also want to say congratulations to all the teams out there that have qualified for uh, playoffs. Nationals for youth is going on this weekend. I think that is a great time of year. Uh, I can't wait. I'm excited to watch some hockey this weekend. Uh, junior playoffs starting and some are already going. Uh, that's great. Some of you saw the post today that I put up about the uh, Brahmas. And uh, I'm just so proud to be a part of an organization like that. Uh, we took the overall uh, points uh, title for the North American Hockey League this year. And uh, Mike and I are ecstatic, and we're both very excited to be a part of that program. Tonight, 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 we're going to cover two topics. We're going to cover some of the back, back office, uh, higher-end, analytic prep for uh, juniors and trying to get ready for the draft. And this isn't just for juniors. This is used at the, the pro level too, to, to some extent. And every team's different. This is just the way we do things. And uh, I should say I do things and, and we do things to try to get better as a uh, organization. So we're going to cover that. We're also going to cover, uh, you know, a just some, some phenomenal statistics on one organization and their ascension to the highest parts of hockey and that just an incredible percentage of players that make it out of this organization. We're going to cover that organization. And uh, most likely you or your son probably aren't going to get into this league. And I'll tell you why. And it's not because of your talent level now. Uh, so we'll, we'll have some fun with that too. So with that said, let's get rolling. Wow, that was quick. Didn't even get a chance to to uh, grab a, my my tea. I'm actually drinking tea. I do one one cup, one cup of uh, caffeinated coffee a week, and it's right before the show. And then during the show, I'm drinking tea. And this has been going. Hey, you know, we've been on. I think we've. This is like seven consecutive weeks, maybe eight consecutive weeks. We haven't missed. Knock on wood. We're you know in that consistent flow now. All the wacky things. That were going on. Uh, you probably know I, I downsized last year uh, from our house uh, in one of the suburbs of Rochester. We moved further out and we got a uh, a smaller. We got a condo, my wife and I, and uh, uh, we did a lot of work to it right off the bat. Uh, you know, replaced the kitchen, replaced all the floors. Uh, you know, took out a fireplace, and uh, that just got in the way of so many things because there was dust and a mess all over the place, and it was really hard to try to get a spot to do what I'm doing right now because everything was just all tore up. So we're almost done. We're stabilized, it, 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 a lot more stabilized than we were. So uh, I'm looking forward to the consistency that comes along with that. So I think we're going to try to make a run all the way through the spring here and take a little break in the, in the summertime. Let us know what your thoughts are on that. I see some people already checking in. It's going to be a great show. Let's start off with the analytics. So, you know, we're all prepping for the the uh, the the draft that is coming up for our league. It's the null the null the North American Hockey League. We um oh that's good oh that's good. We we uh, we start preparing for this virtually right after the uh, the definitely after main camp and when the season gets rolling into the fall because after main camp we get a chance to assess. You know, who made the cut at main camp as far as the draft picks from last year and, uh, you know, who didn't make it. And we started assessing why we missed the boat on some and you know, some some we know. Now, there's you know, every team drafts differently. And when I say that, some draft for the whales, they're looking to hit a home run with a kid uh, that's in the USHL. Maybe there's a kid in the BCHL. Maybe there's a kid in the NCDC that's tearing it up. And a whale is 
you know, taking a shot at a kid from somewhere else. Sometimes you'll even see NCAA Division One players drafted because maybe they uh, they went to college young. Maybe it wasn't working out. You hear that maybe their grades weren't so good. Maybe you you know that they're uh, not happy with the way things are. It's not that it, the, the school or the social or the team don't fit for them. So you'll you'll see from time to time even players in Division One drafted, and that's that's whale hunting. You're looking for the big home run. So those are low percentage uh, draft picks. Set those aside. That's one category. You know, you you can go into youth and draft there. You can go into uh, other leagues and draft there. It's it's an open palette for what you draft and what you're looking to draft. Now, every team uh, does it differently. Like I said, we try to establish, you know, a a policy, and this is uh, something that I brought into the organization is trying to trying to find a fit that gives us best in league standards and trying to establish, you know, that, that across the board, we are the ones to shoot for now. You know, Hey, look, I know I'm going to give away some things that other, uh, other organizations can use tonight. I'm fine with that because, uh, I've given this away in lectures, you know, for USA hockey for the level five and the level four before, and, you know, there are some people that buy in and there's some people that just don't want to do the work. And what I mean by doing the work is drafts are, are, are the evaluation of drafts are on two issues, two things in my book. Yeah. And then some other layers come in afterwards. But the first two things are efficiency in the draft. And what does efficiency mean? What is the percentage of players that you draft that make the roster? So if I draft let's say an even number at 10, you know, when my, it, if, if I get one kid to stick, that's 10%, five kids, that's 50%, you know, six kids, 60%, you get it. And then the, the second part of that efficiency is comparing yourself to the other teams in the league. How many did they draft? How many did they have that made the roster? A secondary number is how many kids that you draft that maybe didn't make it through your main camp, but still are established in the North American hockey league in our case, so that's not the first efficiency number, but that's another layer of it. In other words, we, we drafted 10, uh, five players made our team, but three other players made other teams after our main camp. So in other words, they didn't make it with us uh, for, it could be a myriad of reasons. Maybe they're a goalie and they're really, really good, but we had two established goalies uh, that we didn't know where they were going to go or if they were going to leave to go to college earlier or you know, play in another league. All of a sudden, we still establish those two. They're good for us. We have no intentions of uh, moving away from those two. But we had a you know had a guy drafted that was phenomenal, um, and he gets picked up by another team. So that's a secondary efficiency number that we we roll into this, saying, "Hey, look, even though they didn't work out with us, they're still null quality." Meaning we did our job as as a scouting staff to bring in the right players. So you shouldn't be punished because. Uh, you found the right talent. They just didn't fit into the team for other circumstances. So that's part of the efficiency number. The other side of this that's important is the effectiveness. So you've got this efficiency. You know, five players make the team. Now, are they are they in games? Are they playing games? And every team establishes a different level. We establish a level that we we want to see them. Uh, they're they're in that effective range if they play half the season or more. Okay, then they they fall into the okay. They're effective as far as making the lineup. Now you can start for for forwards. You can start counting points, and uh, for defensemen you can count minutes, goalies, goals against, and minutes. You know what what they're doing to produce for you. So you you have to look at efficiency and effectiveness both together. Now here's the part that gets hard. We use a rolling five-year number on our team. We look back five years and see how our trends are moving. I'm not going to give you anything in writing on this because that is, that's something that I don't want other teams to have. So I'm not going to you know, give you our spreadsheets on this. So you got to bear with me on this and kind of have a, a visual picture of what I'm talking about. So we look at efficiency and effectiveness. We look at secondary efficiency, which means kids that still stay in the league. And then there's another number in that draft that we, we play in on that efficiency. That's that first category which is how many kids that we drafted either went to play NCAA college hockey or ended up in the USHL in those two categories. And once again, we don't, we don't 
look at that and, and, and ding our staff of, of scouts because they're picking up kids that move on. Now, if it's consistent where, hey, geez, you keep picking kids that are you know leaving for college already, that's an issue because then you're not knowing your market and you're not really doing your homework to find out if players are going to play juniors or not. If they if they already got to commit, you know, you should know that. Uh, some kids get, you know, called up early or they find out uh, late that a team has an opening for whatever reason. So does that make sense? You know, throw up your comments if this is just I'm talking too fast and I've got too much caffeine in me. But once again, we're looking at how many kids actually stick on our team. That's the first number we look at every year. The second number is how effective they were for us. Now, once we get those two and we know what our rolling average is, then we go out and look at the rest of the league. And then we, we, we put ourselves up against the other teams that we know. We look at the same categories with every other team. We look at their efficiency and we look at their effectiveness. And we see how much uh, we have in common and how many things we're, we're different in. Okay, man, they're really efficient, uh, but th their effectiveness, they're not really playing those kids much. In other words, maybe they brought all 10 kids. And now here's the, the second point. Some teams, if you're drafted, just like you're tendered, you know, there are teams in the null that it's almost a shoe in that if you get tendered or drafted, you're going to stay. You're going to make it through main camp. There's other teams that is still, you know, you've got to beat out veterans. You got to beat out tenders. You got to beat out draft picks. You got to beat out, you know, uh, invited players. You got to beat out kids that made it from the pre draft. You got to beat out everybody to make that roster. There is no, you know, there's no finality uh, once you get that tender or that draft in your hand that you're going to make that roster. So we tend to be one of those teams where, you know, yeah, that got you a ticket to main camp. Now you got to prove yourself at main camp and then, in the fall, when there's 30, 32 kids there, you still got to make it as the roster gets down, uh, trimmed down to 25 or so kids. So there's two different levels on that. Um, so here's a question for you. As I'm talking about this, and we've got efficiency and effectiveness, and we're only talking about the draft, what do you think the number is that would make you good in the North American Hockey League as far as the staff, as far as the draft goes? And what I mean is, what's the efficiency number you think and I'd love to see it in the comments. Is that number, if you get 30% of your draft picks to make the roster, if you get 40% of your draft picks to make the roster, what, and it could be 100%. What is the number you think, of course, if you're getting 100% every year, you're doing great, okay? You're doing great, and uh, I get it. I can tell you this right now, nobody's running at 100% in the North American Hockey League. What are your thoughts on that? Love to see your comments on that. Just throw a number up. Give me a number. I know we've got quite a few people on already, but uh, you know nobody except for saying go Brahmas and love the Brahmas, which is great. Uh, I'd still love to see. Uh, I still like to see what your number is. Throw your number up and tell me what you think as far as uh, what uh, RJ says. Twenty five percent. Okay, that we'll, we'll we'll see that. Let's see if we can get a couple other guesses up there because um, that's that's interesting, RJ. That you say twenty five. I uh, we got a twenty a twenty percent coming in. And uh, we've got 25. Do we hear 30? Do we hear 30? Anybody on a 30? Uh, Frank says 70, 70%. 70 and once again, I didn't throw this one up there, but RJ said 25%. So 70% uh, would be good. That would be real good. And I can tell you right now that 50% uh, is great, okay? Uh, the standard of excellence, excellence. I would say that number would be somewhere more like uh, da, 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 da. 60% is really, really good. Uh, we had one season uh, two years ago where we had 66% uh, for our team. And, you know, the, the, the leader in the league this season had a efficiency number. Do, 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 do. I just had it in my hands. I think they had a low 60s and it was the best in the league this from this last draft. Um, and I'm not afraid to say who it was because they, they did a good job. They probably should get the uh, the uh, credit for it. And that was Maryland. And uh, Maryland had, you know, low 60s. So pretty darn good job there, if you ask me, with uh, low 60s on that. Uh, anybody got a guess on why Maryland may have better numbers than uh, everybody else? What is there a contributing factor to Maryland's 
uh, success on that side. And I believe that, uh, you know, across the board, they, uh, they've been one of the better programs that have been around for the last few years. They were first place team this year. They were 40 and 13 with, uh, uh, three shutout losses, 86 points, 85 points. Um, that's not bad. That's, that's a really good program this year, um, in their division. You know, the South with us had 94, the, uh, the Midwest, Leader had 90 or 82 points. That's Wisconsin. Uh, Maryland had uh, 86 points in the uh, East Division, and then the uh, the Central Division had 85 points with mine out, uh, the Monteros. So um, th- that's that's pretty darn good across. I really really enjoy those numbers um, and seeing you know, the tops and what the tops are doing. So now. I'm trying to make this so to be more of an educational series as we go through and not trying to hit you up with all the analytics that we use to, to, to pick a draft. So the next part of what we do is after we take the efficiency and effectiveness numbers, then the deep dive comes in. So we've got a rolling five-year average of how our draft picks did as far as making our rosters, how effective they were once they were on the roster and what they did on there. Uh, then it's a it's a it's a deep dive into the rest of the league and seeing what they've done for the year too. Same exact number. So we pull up every single player that was drafted per team, and we see a do they stick on the roster? B you know were were they doing anything when they were on the roster? In other words, were they in the lineup? Were they you know you can be on the roster but not in the lineup. Uh, you can be in the lineup and not get much ice and not you know have any effective uh, value to the team. And maybe that's because uh, maybe it's because they play a, a a very small role in the team, or maybe that's because they're just young and the team's just working slowly. It, it, that's not what I try to decide. What I'm trying to look at is trying to see if uh, you know, across the board the overall trend. So once we've got those two two items secured in the league and we know what the league's doing, then we go back and start looking at where the players come from. Okay, where are players that our team takes, where are we getting them? What, what was the, um, what was the key to a draft Now I, I got a window open. I'm just trying to close while I'm talking to you here and uh, I can't see why it's open, but it's in the way. And it irritates me when there's something on the screen that I can't close so I can see your comments. So, uh, Oh, there we go. I just got it. Got to get it out of the way here. There we go. Okay. Um, so, Okay, let me let me uh, answer one question before I move on. Uh, Frank asks, "Are these numbers on EP?" What a great question! That is just an incredible question. If you have premium on uh, elite prospects, what you can do is you can go back and dig for these numbers. None of these numbers are just a click of the button. That's why it takes a little more elbow grease. You can pull up the null draft, and it's easiest to, to pull up the null draft on the null site. And uh, if you just, I would Google. Null Draft 2023. It'll pull up the page on the Null where you can pull up the draft and look at it. And then I I usually sort from there. And let me see if I can pull that up while we're speaking, and I'll show you that. Uh, let's go Null Draft 2023. And uh, two two two. Maybe I. Spoke to maybe it's because I put 2912 in for the draft. I think 2023 works much better than putting that future draft in. That okay, so let me pull that screen up for you. Okay, you should have that screen now, and this is uh. Frank asked the question about the draft. So um, you can view the results of the draft right there. Boom. I just pull that up. Now, here's the total draft across the board. You can see who got the first pick. We never get the first pick. We never get the second. We never, you know, we're always down here because you know, when you, you do well during the season, you end up being uh, a team that picks very low in the draft. So there we are, first pick at 30. Now, with that being said, what I do on this is I want to see by team. So what I do is I pull it up by team so I can get quick information. I want to know Aberdeen across the board, who they picked, 
what round they picked them in. And, you know, see Aberdeen only had three picks that year because they either traded off their picks or they used them for, for like this one from El Paso. There's just a lot of, there was a lot of horse trading going on there. But now what I can do is I can look at every single team and, you know, who their picks were, you know, where they came from hometown wise in their last team. Those are all things I'm going to use. So yes, I, I garner all this information here and I build a spreadsheet with this, with all these different teams. This is getting into, you know, like I said, you know, most people won't take the time or the effort to do this. Um, and that's why I don't have a problem sharing it. If you want to do that, you know, put the hours and hours and days and days into this to build your spreadsheet, yeah, go for it. Um, that's what it takes to, to get this information. So you start here, you build your spreadsheet out team by team with their ranked picks. So I can see, for example, here, Amarillo, their first round pick, their fourth round pick, um, their fifth round pick, and the number next to it there, um, I know it's small on your screens, is the actual overall pick. So first round, number 24, Amarillo took uh, Lucas Jeffries. Okay. And the fifth round with the 155th pick, they took uh, Aiden uh, Gary, Epp Gary Eppie, I think you say that. So then, you know, I, I list all that, their height, their, um, their birth year, their position. I don't really care about their hometown, but I really care about their last team. So now that I've got that, that's when I go over to Elite Prospects. And, you know, we, we go into the Elite Prospects screen. And from there, that's when we start picking on the, um, the use of the deep dive. And what I mean by the deep dive is now I, I've got all this information. I want a little bit bigger picture on these players. What I want to know is, you know, how they did do during the season. I want to pull up their season numbers. And I want to see, do they, they have a great year before that? Uh, is this a jump up in points? Do they decline? And here's where the factor comes in that most people don't have this number. And I'm not going to give you this number. I won't give anybody this number. I'm hesitant to give this number to anybody in our organization. There is a factor that you can figure out to gauge other leagues. The NHL uses this all the time. In other words, if the NHL drafts a player from um, – NCAA Division One, every single league inside of Division One, all the different leagues have a different factor number. So if if the player is a thirty point player playing in um, the Big Ten inside of the the uh, Division One, they might get a a point four factor. In other words, take their points times them by point four, and that's the equivalent of what they what they feel that player will be uh, when he steps into the NHL. If they're playing in the OHL, that number is usually a little bit higher, which I would argue with, but that number, it, maybe they get a 0.5 or a 0.6. So whatever points they get in the OHL, that is times by 0.6, and they get that factor. And now the numbers are actually close. There's not a there's not a two-tenths divi div divisor between the the uh, NCAA Division One Big Ten kid and the kid coming out of the OHL. In fact, nowadays, because the, the U.S. – HL is getting so much stronger and NCAA is getting so much stronger as players are developing better on that side of the coin. Um, there's much more emphasis put on giving those players strong numbers now. And, you know, you get a kid coming out of the uh, Quebec major junior hockey league, that factor might be a little lower. Well, we do the same thing. Kid coming out of U18, different leagues, you know, there's an ABC factor on what his production should be. Uh, meaning, uh, maybe one of the top U18 leagues, he gets a factor of this. If you're playing in another uh, league that's a lot weaker, you're getting less of a factor on that. So maybe, and I'm, I'm just making this up, the best tier one kid that we draft um, comes out of the best league, and he's a great player in that league. Uh, he gets a, a factor of 0.7 coming into the null. A kid coming out of that's a really good player coming out of a third level um league at U18, maybe he's only getting a factor of 0.5 or 0.4 coming out of that league uh, as far as our draft analysis goes, if that makes sense. You know, it's not equal. You've heard that. You know, we say this all the time. And you hear parents on there giving all their different advice on our site, and God bless everybody, but most aren't putting the analytical work into it to figure out exactly you know, on paper what it looks like as far as the factor goes. Does that make sense to, to all of you? Um, um, <laughs> the uh, the efficiency score with the Brahmas last year, just I know I'm jumping off, but I saw this question come in. Um, this last year, th this is something you can pull up if you want to see it yourselves. 
uh, we did not have our best year. We were six of 13 uh, for 46 points. Our secondary efficiency, um, I did not factor that into this, and so I didn't write it down. I think that pushed us up to, um, you know, maybe another 13 points up or something. We were we we're in the 60 on the secondary. So it wasn't our best year, but it, there's uh, there's extenuating circumstances that we, we did go a little bit well on. But we only had 13 picks. Um, in this draft and um we got what we wanted though <laughs> we, we uh we got exactly what we wanted we we knew what we were going for and uh the ones that we we wanted to stay stayed and it worked out really well with us um and you know I, i'm not going to get into the efficiency or the um effectiveness number because that's something we uh, we're not going to share on this uh, but uh, you can if you really wanted to you could probably do it now everybody gives a different effectiveness number because this is where the the uh this is where the subjectivity comes in a little bit. How many games do you count played to count a kid as being effective? And if it's points that you're using, what's the threshold of points, you know, to be an A-level player, a B-level player, and a C-level player? Those could be different for every team. There is no standard on this. Um, now, when you look into NFL and you look at, you know, the NHL, uh, a lot of teams use these same factors to build in to – to get efficiency and effectiveness, they might call it something something else, but you know, basically, you're you're looking at the same thing, and they all factor in uh, from what leagues you're coming from. So, um, you know, we, you know, we went from 66 last year to 46 this year. Um, that was one of our lowest uh, in the last five years. Uh, but again, we we got exactly what we were looking for. Uh, and, and remember, we're not talking about the tender situation at all. We haven't talked about that that separate, but there are a lot of you know, similarities between rating your tender class. And, and it's harder for me to discuss tenders because they're not public. Uh, there isn't a public list you can go to and grab that shows every team's listed tenders. Um, I have access to that. I have an internal document on that, but I can't share that with you on this platform. Uh, we can talk about it in general terms, but I, uh, I can tell you that um, once again, there are teams out there with their tenders that it's almost a shoe in that unless, you know, you really, really don't come in prepared, you're going to make it if you're a tender and there's other programs that don't have that policy. So there's a little bit different look on how people use, utilize tenders and, and think about tenders. So um, any other questions on, on this, this item? I didn't want to get too deep into it. Um, just waiting to see if anything pops in a couple of this. Thank yous. I won't have to post all those, but, Okay, that's that's it on that. I mean, it's not. It takes uh, it takes several weeks for me to compile this uh, each year. I do it for all of our scouting staff. I do it for our our coaching staff too, and uh, we share this and we talk about it. It also gives our our staff a better picture of what you know what works. Okay, okay, look here's it. Here's the guys that make it every year. Here's where they're coming from, and then we compile that and look at it. We've got a rolling five-year average, here's what makes our team. Here's, once they make the team, here are the guys that are, that, are, that are creeping up to the top. What do they have in common? Is it the same league they're coming out of? Is it the style of play they're, they're at? Is it the, you know, the level? Is U18 different than prep? Is, uh, you know, picking up a player in juniors better than U18 or a prep player? Uh, and, of course, age factors into this. Uh, one of the things that's very, you know, important to do is, to also watch, and this where gets it a little bit uh, trickier, especially when it comes to uh, potential trades inside the league. Um, let's say a player is playing on the East Coast uh, in the, the the East for the Null, and they've got a player that's played for them for two years and is, is, is going into his last year, and they've put him up for a trade. So if that's the case, they've got a player for trade, um, a deep dive into that team to see how – they're players that made the roster, played a year, and then came back as a second-year veteran, how much improvement they got. If they've got a record of second-year to third-year players, how much improvement do you see in them? In other words, you know, most players in the league, if uh, and we're using points now, and that's different with goalies, and it's also different with uh, defensemen. The defensemen may be on a points if they're on offensive defensemen. Usually if they get 15, 20 points or, or more a year, you can start rating them with, with this scale too. Um, you look at things like what's the improvement from year to year? 
So if we're looking to pick up a veteran player um, and we see a kid had 15 points his first year, he had 25 points his next year, then we go to the team and see what's their track record for that third-year player. Does a third-year player get relegated because fresh bodies are coming in? Does a third-year player get more of a leash? Um, and you kind of see how they develop for that next level of points. Uh, if there's a team out there that, you know, all of a sudden a third player comes around uh, and his numbers go away, or excuse me, a second year player and his numbers go down from the, from first year to second year, we're kind of hesitant looking at him to say, why would we want a third year player that his last season went down? And you look at the whole team and take their, their, the, the whole picture into to account also. How are they, how are they at developing the efficiency side of their players once they've got them on their roster. So just like they do in the NHL, you know, we're looking at the track record of the player. If he stayed with an organization in youth um, and he played 15, 16, and, and his 17th year um, with a team, meaning his first year of U18, how did he do? Did he go from 15 to 16 and make a jump in points? Was he staying consistent when he went to 18s? Um, and if it's a guy that's got two years of 18 under his belt, did he make another jump his second year of 18s? Um, if he's in prep, how did he do as he moved from one year to another? If he's a junior player and he started off maybe in the, the Premier League, then he went to the NCDC, how was his transition? And what was his drop off? Or did he maintain those points? All those things uh, come into factor on this. And we, we look at all these kind of numbers. Uh, and then, once again, this is one faction. This is not everything we do. We're not talking about watching a player. We're not talking about skills evaluation. We're not talking about putting him through any kind of other uh, areas. We're just talking about how he looks on paper and uh, where he comes from and how that part of the draft comes in. So let's just get on the board here before we change subjects and see what's going on. Frank, thanks so much. I appreciate you putting that in there. Um, let's see what the next comment is. Oh, we already got that one. Here's another one. Um, for calculating these values, do you take the league stats at face value? Some leagues are horrible. Of, of course, we do if it's the null. The null is extremely accurate on their numbers. Um, you may argue that, but they get scrutinized. Uh, most of them are on live. You know, well, all of them are being watched live on video. What, you know, There's people watching them. You've got the, uh, the central staff of the null, the nucleus, that you know, the, the administration there that actually watch the games. You've got player, or excuse me, player review, because they all get a copy of their shifts. And if they see something wrong with their shift, they, I got an assister, you know, uh, you know, that I got a hit on that, that I didn't get a credit for a coach. You know, nobody's tracking hits at this, you know, from the scouting side, but internally that that's important to a kid. An assist is important. They'll review that and they'll correct that. If there's an assist there, uh, if, if the kid get, gets a plus minus, that's wrong. Uh, they'll review that too. And, and they'll correct that most junior leagues, um, tier two, tier one, uh, BCHL, AJHL, they're correcting all that stuff. So, you know, we, we take that to, to heart. And to be honest with you, the stats we're looking at, um, we usually verify it through the coach, how accurate they are just to, you know, ask, Hey, are, you know, we see this kid's got 60 points. Um, is that, is that correct? Is that number good? And a coach will say, yeah, that's good. Or he's probably got a couple that we lost in a tournament, but, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty good right there. So yeah, you know, we're not, if something looks really out of whack on a kid, you know, if a kid's got 150 points and, you know, he's 40 points ahead of everybody else in the league, uh, we usually question that. And we also, maybe we ask around to see if they, uh, if there's a little padding going on at that U16 team or, and that does happen from time to time, but you know, most of the time that's not the case. So do we check it? Yes. So the, those values, you know, once again, we're, you know, we're pretty thorough on that. And we've probably watched the kid, if, if we're going to draft a kid, we probably watched him through several sets of eyes no, no, uh, numerous times. And so we get an idea real quick on if those numbers are accurate or not. So if we watch him play and we don't see him touch the puck, and he's got two assists at the end of the games. We're, uh, oh, you got two assists. I, I don't remember seeing those. Which goals did you get those on? We talk it out. We ask the coach about it. And, you know, rarely, you know, maybe – once every other year, do I run across something that's so egregious that I I have to take it in a, in a factor or play it in a factor? That doesn't really come into play much. But it's a good question. I appreciate the question on that. All right, anybody else got a question on that? I once again, I didn't want to get too deep into it. You know, we've spent uh, probably more time than I expected to spend on this. 
yeah, we, I wanted to get through it in less than 25 minutes. It took me 35 minutes, but you know, think about it. We, you can ask questions later in the show once we're done with this next section and, and come back to it. But uh, hopefully you get a little bit of an idea now. There's a lot of legwork that goes into this. Um, I will do this too, not consistency, consistently, but I will break down other junior leagues. I will break down U18s. Sometimes I'll even do, you know, I think the last time I did it was about three years. I broke down preps and I'll do the same thing with their players. And I'll look at a roster, find out where they're getting their players from. And you can do all this. This is nothing different than the reverse engineering that I talk about all the time. Um, hey, look, if if I'm in the null and I'm looking at a player from U18, I can find out where he came from to get to that U18 team. If I'm looking at a player in another junior league, I can look at where he came from and start building a story and work backwards from there. Um, that's the whole idea of it. You know, I, I would like to see the point where elite prospects actually gives me more information about coaches a kid played for and give me records on those coaches, you know, give me history of the coach on like a player. I can tell who he played with and I can also see where all those players are at now, how successful is that team? But I can't tell what, players are associated with what coach, you know, skills, skills guys do this all the time on resumes. You see this all the time. Oh, I have 54 NHLers that I helped produce over the last uh, 30 years. You know, I'm nowhere near that. You know, my NHL number, you know, first of all, I don't take any credit for an NHL or anyway, I might've worked with them and skills. They might've played on my team, but uh, an NHL has got so much other go else going on. My, my little window is not what put him over the edge. Hopefully I, didn't get in that player's way uh, on his ascension. And uh, that's the way I look at it. So I, I, I tend to try to stay a little more humble on thinking that I'm the reason why guys are in the NHL, even though they may have played for me or came through my organization or did skills drills with me. So uh, uh, that's uh, that's pretty much it on the subject. Well, we got one more. I'll get in here and, and grab uh, Tom. Tom says, are you looking strictly at points or do you look at other attributes uh, for different roles in the, in the lineup. Of course we look at other attributes, but you know, the hardest thing to find is uh, skilled offensive players that can produce at the, the higher levels. Um, I'm not saying it's easier to get a defenseman. Not at all. I didn't mean that I'm talking about forwards. You get 12 forwards. Um, you know, we might take three guys that are strong on, you know, playing the game, defensive role, energy guys, but we're looking for 10, 12 guys that, that can can grow into scorers because that's the hardest role to find. So um, it's it's also proportional. Maybe all of our goal scorers are staying or any team that's drafting, they're staying, and you're looking for either younger players you can grow into roles or you're looking for big, strong guys that can make you know a difference on your defensive side of your offensive players. So um, that's a hard question to really give you a, a strong answer on because – it, it, that one changes so much. And it also depends on what you have returning, what you tendered. And, uh, and of course, as you, as you look at that, if you've got like, you know, the, for example, this year, our, our, our captain of the team is one of our stronger defensive players. Um, he put up good numbers before he came to our program. Um, so sometimes once they get into the program, their roles adjust. It's just like, you know, you look at Joey Koser he was a you know a fighter in the NHL, uh, but he was coming out of juniors as one of the top points players, and uh, he had an incredible good run on points. He was over a hundred point guy, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but his numbers were really high. Um, but he adjusted his game and brought out another side of his game that he had in the NHL to to keep the career going, to keep you know, moving forward with uh, the game. So, um, yes, Tom, we do look at a lot of factors. But I can tell you this, you know, we're not going to have, you know, you know, four lines, 12 guys of forwards out there that are just uh, were brought on the team for other than points. That's just uh, this is not the reality of the world on that. So hopefully it helps a little bit. And, and remember, I'm not talking when I'm talking right now, 90 uh, percent of what I'm talking about is not directly related to the team I'm working with now. This is talking about the overall process a little bit with the role I'm in right now with one team but a lot of information with the overall process and, and what people that are really professionals when they when they say they're scouts or player development directors, 
what they're really doing. Good coaches, good general managers, they might do this information themselves or they just might make sure somebody on staff is doing it so they've got that picture and they can rely on them. Some coaches, this is the what I present to a general manager of our team, which happens to be our coach. He takes that information whatever way he wants to run with it. Um, he doesn't take that information and, and run with it as gospel. I might say, hey, look, this is the league we get the best results out of. This is the league that we get the least results out of. That coach has never given us a player that's that's good. That coach has been three for three with his last three players. We've hit home runs with him. Those might be the facts. And our, our head coach come draft time says, no, I want this kid. That's fine. That's, you know, I did my job. You know, I'm not, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not there to try to override the uh, the final decision on this. Hope that makes sense. Um, thank you on the comment there. Let's change gears. <clears throat> Let's get into the fun topic for the night. Excuse me, folks. Without Mike here, I can't flip the the, uh, the camera over to Mike and the, and mute myself and and cough when I get a cough. So you get what you get. But I do have my really good tea to help here. So let's talk about. I teased you guys a little bit with it. I'm going to go down to a small screen, and I'm going to pull up this this little presentation I put together. One organization has 43% of the rosters, the, the starting rosters played in this organization of the four teams in the Frozen Four. Michigan has 10 of these players. BU has eight of these players. BC has eight of these players. Denver has eight of these players. What organization? Holy smokes. It's not the USHL. Not the NAL. It's not the BCHL. What organization has 43%? Now, the USHL might be higher. Should be. You know, a lot of players funnel through the USHL to get to the um, to the league. But I'm going to give you another piece of information on this because it's going to get interesting for you as we talk about this. Let me change the slide here. Oh, there we go. Michigan, BUBC, Denver. 10 8, 8, 8 as far as this goes. And as far as the draft picks that go along with that, BC, eight players, six of them are drafted in the NHL from this one organization. BU, eight players came from this organization. Six of them are draft picks. Michigan, 10 players, six are draft picks. Denver, eight players, four draft picks. Anybody have a guess? Anybody out there have a guess what organization I'm talking about? I'll wait. Nobody wants to take a stab at this one? I know I'm on a little bit of a delay, so I got to give you a second before that number pops into me. Um, some of the platforms, it's about a 40-second delay. Some it's about a 30-second delay before you actually get the number. So when I ask for a question, um, it takes a second before you get it. Uh, this will be – actually, Brandon, what I'm going to do with this number is we're going to look together on this one to see what the USHL in the ND – in TDP does. Uh, this is a great answer. Uh, Brooks does an awesome job and they put a lot of players up, but uh, not even Brooks or, or Lone Star or any one player or what, any one team has those kind of numbers. AJ, uh, nope, that's that's a, that's a good guess too. Uh, it's not the AJ. Let me give you a little more information. It's the brick. Think about this. Anybody know what the brick is? Uh, put it in the comments if you're familiar with it, but it's a summer tournament. 230 average, they you know, give or take a few players um, are there. 12 teams. Didn't used to be 12 teams, but they got 12 teams now. I think they might even be a little over 12 this year. Um, <laughs> a 10-year-old tournament. For 10-year-olds, folks, 43% of the final four, 43% made it that far. Now, when you hear... When you hear somebody say, ah, you know, you're putting too much pressure on those kids. Let me go through the statistics on this. 10-year-old players and the numbers are amazing. Amazing coming out of this tournament. Yes, it's uh, it's in, uh, it's held out in Edmonton. There's Edmonton or Calgary. I've only been to it once myself in person. Uh, the year my son made the team, he broke his wrist. We didn't make the trip with the team. The team ended up winning the whole thing. Uh, we were skating with a team out of Toronto. 
uh, it's it's an incredible event. It's in a mall. In fact, I put a picture of the mall up right there, and it is great. I just can't remember if we got off in Edmonton. or I've been out to both those places so many times, I get them confused. I believe it's Edmonton. You probably would know. Um, so we got comments coming in on this. You know, yeah, top 10-year-olds. And uh, it's the Brick Invitational. Good guess when you got that. And the other one is my son played in 2019. What an incredible experience. I'm so glad you got to go. If, if, if you're still young or if you still have it, that's why I said most people are not going to get into this is because it happened already uh, in most of your players' careers. They, they've already passed that up. And unless you get one of those Cuban uh, birth certificates where you can, uh, you know, just like in baseball with the Little League World Series and you can play in the event when you're five years older, six years older, uh, in other words, it's past you then. All right, let's look a little more. Let's take a little more deep, deeper dive into this. Ten-year-old players, ten years old. Some kids play this at nine. Some get two years into this. Not many. Now here's where it gets a little fun. Fifty-four percent. Fifty-four percent. Now, what do I mean by fifty-four percent? We'll get back to that, but I'm going to show you what I mean. Fifty-four percent make it into the NHL, OHL, Q, all the major juniors, the NCAA, the NAL, the USHL, and all the pro leagues, the AHL, EC, uh, ECHL, and the KHL over in Russia. I didn't look into the Europeans because that's that, that would have been a deep dive that would have taken me a long time to go through all the pro leagues in, in Europe to figure it out. But look at those areas. That's the top of the top of hockey right there. The NCAA. BCHL, if you don't know what U Sports is, that's the Canadian equivalent to the NHL, and it picks up all the major junior guys that, uh, because they used up their eligibility or they're their not granted eligibility in the NCAA, they still can play hockey in the U Sport after the OHL or the major junior, and they can play for great schools, get a great education. And those teams are good. Those teams are real good. You'll see, you know, in the preseason for the NCAA Division One, you'll see a lot of teams play a U sport team and the scores aren't always what you think they're going to be. You, you think they're going to be blowouts on the, the American side and they're not because these are good programs. They got a lot of, you can even be a guy that gets into the East coast or the AHL. And uh, depending on how your contract was written up, you can still go back to the, and be eligible for U sports. And, and once again, contingent on your contract, you might even be able to use uh, your, um, your money from the OHL or major junior hockey, uh, depending on how that was and what year you came out. So those are the areas. Let's look a little bit deeper into the numbers on this. 8% of the NHL current players, 8% played in the brick. You know, <laughs> that's one out of 10. That means that there's a couple players. Each team has uh, 32 players that, that scroll through during the season. That's about the average in the NHL. They see about 32 players move in and out of the lineups. Of that number, that means that you most likely you've got three guys that played in the brick on every roster on average, the, in the NHL. Think about that. Identified at 10 years old. Tell me another league. Tell me another team. Tell me another organization. Uh, and we'll look at the USHL because I want to do a comparison on that. And I didn't have time to do it, so we'll do that live. 510 players are in the upper levels of juniors. Um, and I'll give you the numbers on those uh, as individual leagues. So these are all the junior leagues. We'll do the major juniors first. And the major juniors, the um, OHL has 82. The Western League has 160. And the uh, Q, the Quebec uh, Major Junior Hockey League, is 35. So how does that compare to the NAL has 60, the USHL has 129, and the BCHL has 79. So that's where those numbers are coming from. So the, the USHL is only second to the WHL, which makes sense. This is a Western, it is Edmonton, and it is a, it's a Western tournament. It's probably going to get a lot more looks from the Western League because it's right there in their backyard. So you get a lot of the, the WHL guys, uh, scouts, general managers, coaches, get a chance to watch the brick in the summer, and they do. You know, when people say they don't start scouting at this age, I'm going to tell you, I'll, I'll call bullshit to that any day. There's NHL guys that know what's going on in the brick. They, even if they're not there in person, they got somebody there watching it for them. Um, there are scouts that know all the stats coming out of this, and and I'm going to show you why in a second because I'll pull up another graph for you in a second. Let's jump onto something else here. 
346 professional players. Now, remember, this is current. All these numbers I'm giving you are a snapshot of right now what's going on now. There are 346 players. Now, remember, this the last was a 2013. Those kids are 10. So 2012 or 2023, I'm sorry, 2023, those kids were 10. So that means uh, 2022, they're 11. You got to work backwards on that number uh, to get to what there's the, the only current years for kids at that age are the kids that are like 17 and older. And I wrote that number down. I just got to find the piece of paper on that. In other words, what I mean is when I, when I say the professional players or the NCAA or major junior numbers, these are from kids that are current. This doesn't add up all the players that did play NCAA since 2000. I think the first year I used was the, um, the 2009 class, I believe it was at the, uh, the 2009 tournament, which was the 99 birth years, 99 birth years. And I'll, I'm going to pull that up in a second to show you how good that one class did. But think about that. 346, and I put the number, it's hard to see. 61 in the NHL, 99 in the AHL. Uh, East Coast League's got 48, and the KHL has two. Uh, that's that's incredible. And I'm going to get to a couple comments because there's some comments coming in on this. Give me a second on that, though. Uh, let's get through the NCAA numbers and just look at that, too. Um, oh, that slide shouldn't be there. Once again, I put this together. 283 currently in college hockey. That's only U sport, which is 37 and the NCAA division one, which is 210. But you know, when you start adding up these numbers, you know, you're starting to get into numbers that are crazy that of the last, um, once again, this is only looking at the, the, the brick from the 09 brick year, 2009, through 2016, there's eight years there. Of that eight years, um, there was a total of 800 or 1,816 players that played in that. 972, well over half. I believe that number gets them well over half. Uh, oh, of course it gets them well over half. Uh, 972 is more than half of 1,816. Uh, are playing either major junior, NCAA, elite American uh, juniors, or they're playing pro already. Uh, which is incredible. And you know, they have to understand that, you know, there's, you know, 54% of the, the of that group, that's the number I'm looking for, 54%, which I showed you on a graph earlier, half of that group is playing currently, right now, of the, the, the brick from 2009 to 2016, 2009 to 2016, the 08, 09 to uh, the... Oh, 1617. I'm sorry, 1617 to 09 through 17. Of those years, 1,800 players, 54% of them are playing at the highest levels you can play at. That's that's just an incredible stat that shows you, yes, you know, and this is why this important statement that came in, I'm glad you put this up here. And uh, this one's a little bit longer. Getting on a brick team is not easy and generally shows a high level of, of athlete and family commitment to the sport, financial and time. So it's not surprising that the athletes continue to be committed and succeed. The kids also get a taste of what it's like. I'm assuming that's what it goes on to say. I, I didn't get the full comment. Absolutely. Absolutely. In other words, people have to make decisions on talent at 10, and those decisions are very effective. If you put this into the efficiency and effective model, you know, we're looking for 60% is a, is a benchmark, 65% is a benchmark, to be successful, our level on our draft level picks, okay, they're already hitting it at 10 years old, okay? In other words, people are picking the kids that do make it. Now, you're right. Some of this is because they these kids have some things in their favor. They've got a committed family that are willing to sacrifice at that age. Absolutely. Absolutely. They probably have a lot more ice time than most. They're probably already playing on great teams, Um as a, as in our family, uh, we had a kid that, that made the brick and he, uh, was playing for, um, uh, pro hockey development out of, uh, Toronto. Uh, and it was between them and the Bulldogs and which team he was going to go with because he had played with both of them and, uh, and had fun with both. They had friends on both teams, uh, picked the bro, pro hockey team development team. And geez, the, 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 the roster was just chock full of good players just chock full of good players. And 
But these are players that you knew were good from seven, eight, nine years old. It was very clear they were the better players, you know, in the the better leagues. So absolutely, you're you're getting chosen for these teams. It's a tryout, but isn't every team supposed to be a tryout? I mean, yeah, I get it. Some people say, oh, you know, 10 years old, that's way too soon. It wasn't too soon for Tiger Woods. It wasn't too soon for Serena Williams. It wasn't too soon for Ronaldo if you're a soccer person. You know, when, when people say it's not too soon, uh, why? Why is, it not, why is it too soon? If there's an avenue and they're enjoying it and the family is enthusiastic and can support it, I just don't understand. I know you're not saying that in that comment. I wasn't, that was a very positive comment. I'm not trying to argue with the comment. I'm just trying to add to that comment and to kind of pull it out a little bit more. Um, you know, yes. <laughs> Is it an elite sport, especially financially? Can you play the sport without money? It's hard. You can. Can you do some of the things like the brick if you don't have money? You know, there are players. I do know players that, that, you know, there's a league or there's somebody that sugar daddies them. Hey, hey, good for them. That happens in other sports too. You see golfers get sugar daddied all along. Uh, hey, we'll invest this much into this 17-year-old player or this 18-year-old player in their career, and then we want a return on the money as they win tournaments. It happens in other sports where you're supported by a, usually a group of people that back you. It happens a little bit in hockey, but most for the most part, those golfers don't have the money to do what they need to do to make the pros. And they usually get, you know, I, I don't even think sugar daddy's nice. That's probably not appropriate. It's an investment. Pe- people that invest in them to help them grow their build, uh, business. And uh, it is a, it is, it, we, I get these in the email, an email on this once in a while. There'll be a local golfer that's really good at 17 years old. He's going to jump down and play on one of the minor tournaments. And they're looking for people to invest in him uh, to get his career going. And, you know, some people can put, hundred thousand dollars into a kid. And that does happen rarely in hockey. I've seen it on the Toronto market more than I've seen it anywhere else, but, uh, it's rare. It's rare. And yes, do you have to have money? Most of the time you do. We all know that, you know, I, you, know you don't get into, uh, you don't get into golf unless you use it going to support playing golf every day in the summer. You don't get into any equestrian sports unless you can afford, uh, you know, horses, you know, <laughs> rugby, you can play with it. You, you, you don't even need anything. You just get a pair of shoes on and a pair of shorts on and, uh, you go out there and punch each other in the nose. But when it comes to hockey, uh, yeah, you need some money. We all know that. I, I appreciate the comment. Um, so anyway, with with this, it, what I wanted to do is I wanted to pull up elite prospects. And I wanted just to look real quick at the U.S. It'll just take a second to do this. Uh, we'll look at the USHL. And uh, we will see if we can pull this up. should be right there. And I'll share that window with you. Okay, so here we are on Elite Prospects. I'm going to go up the top here, and it's really simple to do. Uh, so getting back earlier, we had a uh, a comment about how you can look for this information. And I believe the uh, – I think that came in from – was it – who brought that comment in? Uh, it was Frank. Frank brought this in. So, Frank, here's how you do it. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to pull up the USHL. Simple as that. U-S-H-L. There it is. I click on U-S-H-L. It'll bring me to the league. little lag. Sorry, folks. Now, once I get the league, I go through all the standings. I come down to the players. I hit the green button below the players. This is anytime I'm using the search engine, this is what I want. Now, all I'm going to do is come up here and I'm going to type brick. Right in that top line, Brick Invitational pops up right there. What am I doing? I'm filtering out all the kids. I want to see the kids that played in the Brick. Now, if I wanted to add other things like, you know, show me Brick players that also um, at a certain age or shoot left-handed, I could add all kinds of things in there. But I just want to know how many kids in the USHO played in the Brick. And uh, we can see that number is... 121. The first page shows 100. You come over below that in the gray there. It's 121 on the forwards. And on the goalie side, it looks like we've got eight. So 129 players currently in the league uh, play or played in the brick. So we can go back here, get rid of that. And what I didn't do at first is get a number on what the total number of uh, guys in the USHO currently is at. 
So I get there and hit that number again with nothing in the areas. I can come down here and uh, pull that number. That number is Ford's 528. And goalies, it looks like we got another 37, 47, 57, 60, 57 goalies. So we got just under 600 players, and we've got 120 some odd players that played in the break. So one out of six, that's pretty good odds. You know, we can uh, we can figure it's a little bit higher than what we were thinking about. Um, anyway, that's it's a it's a fantastic thing to look at. It's nothing else than just pure numbers but who would have thought if you if you didn't know this let me get myself back up here if you didn't know this you know now you do you you know that the brick is cool <laughs> the brick is really cool uh it's it's an excellent source of seeing what players are i also told you that i'd pull up and we'd look at just real quick um we would look at the um what did i tell you we we're gonna look at we we're gonna oh we we're gonna look at the um 99 class so let's look at the brick and look at that 99 class and see how they did. It's really incredible numbers here. And that's the last thing we're going to do today. We're not going to spend any more time on anything. Um, so if I just bring up the brick. Invitational. And I think I also had a list of some of the players of names that you might recognize that I wrote down. Because they were pretty special, but... The names are like, um, geez, what are some of the names? Oh, Quentin Hughes, leading defenseman, or one of the leading defensemen in points this year, um, played in the brick. Luke Hughes, his brother, NHL. These are NHL guys. Jack Hughes. But, so three Hughes brothers all play. They all came through different routes in this too. Um, Chuchuk, Brady Chuchuk played in this. And uh, Connor Bernard played in this a couple years ago. In fact, with his age, he might have played in this tournament last year or a year, year or two ago. So anyway, we look at the brick. Let's go down and we'll sort it by uh, year. Right here we go. So I can go in here and I can grab that 2009 season is what I think I want to grab, which the numbers are really good in. Yeah, 09. So let me grab that 09 team. Is it the 09, 010, or is it the... I think it's the 08 and 09. Let's try that first. I'll come down here and uh, hit the show more. And let's just look at this roster here. Uh, you could probably see names that I might not na uh, notice or see as we go through this. But look at the amount of draft picks first. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's Quinn Hughes. There's ten draft picks. Eleven. There's Chuck. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. This is crazy. Fifteen. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. And then no goalies. I don't believe could draft. So 20 draft picks. Think about this. This blows my mind. 10-year-olds that play in one tournament together. Now, this tournament's different than most because they start a year beforehand with most of these teams selecting their team, and they play in some mini tournaments or some tournaments like a, uh, a round robin of tournaments to get ready for the brick itself. But you see the numbers of draft picks? Now, if I click on some of these kids like, uh, Owen Tippett, I don't know where he's at right now, drafted by Philly. He is now playing for Philly. Look at that. And you know, this is this is across the board. It's just amazing to see now. Is he still is he still hanging in there? Yeah, Philly, one year, two year, three years, uh four years, one, two, three, four years of playing as a 99 birth year. Already has four years in the in the uh, NHL. That's incredible. Now I could go through every one of these and we could look at their track records, but I just wanted to point out to you that you know this is you can look at kids at that age and you can say there's talent there, and there are people that are betting on their talent at that age and they're they're making decisions. And if you tell me that a coach at the 
college level, at the junior level, or the pro level, isn't factoring in the brick and you know, the fact that he was part of that brick because it says, hey, this kid's been an elite player. By the time he gets to our team at 18 or 19, he's already been an elite player for eight, nine, 10 years, which says something. So anyway, what are your thoughts? We're going to call it uh, a night as far as uh, what we're doing here. Appreciate everybody. Did you guys see that screen? Did I pull that screen up for you? If I didn't, I apologize. Uh, I'll show it to you real quick just so you got it. This is the list of – that's Owen Tippett. Let me get back to that list for you. I'm sorry. I thought it was on screen. This is that 99 class of players. You see right off the bat the, the top points getter was a draft pick. Then the Detroit Red Wings got Husco. Um, and you just go down the list. You can see the draft picks are you know, all through this list. There's only 10% of the kids that played in this tournament got drafted. <laughs> the other thing real quick on this too is uh, as you look at things like this list, what's interesting is the amount of retention. If you're a big USA hockey fan or you're a big Hockey Canada fan and you really believe in the ADM, throw it out the window on the ADM side because the ADM is against everything that this tournament stands for. But if you you believe in um, retaining players into their adult years, that's what USA Hockey is really big on right now. How do you turn players into lifelong players? The numbers of players at the 10-year-old mark from that brick tournament, the 230 players of that 99 class, the vast majority, I think the number was close to 85%, were still in the game. It might have been higher. I, didn't, I haven't looked at this number in a while. But it was really high. It was pushing 90% of the players. We're still playing the game at 18, 19 years old versus the huge drop off with the rest of, of players coming from different areas of the sport where they, they, they drain off at 14, they drain off at 16, they drain off at 18. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, if you want to put your, your thoughts on even after we're done with the broadcast tonight, uh, thank you very much. We went a little over an hour tonight. I apologize. I wanted this to be short, but I hope it was some information you liked. I hope it was something that was uh, helpful for you. And uh, let me know what else you want to talk about. You can DM me. You can just start a post on the uh, the Facebook group. I really hope that you take the time tonight before you're done to actually jump on and uh, become a member of our, our YouTube page, Junior Hockey Advisor. And if you're not a member of our Facebook page, a lot of you are on our discussion group already. Thank you very much for that. But boy, oh boy, I would jump on the page and both like and follow the page too. We don't always post the same kind of information in all places, and that way you get good information across the board. Don't forget, our archives are just chock full of good information, and uh, you know, please take advantage of going onto YouTube and looking at all the, the videos that we've done, several hundred videos we've done over the last couple of years. Once again, thanks so much, folks. Have a great night, and uh, yeah, keep Mike in your prayers if you can. Uh, he's fine, but uh, he's, the family uh, had a... Uh, a family issue that uh, he could sure use your prayers for if you if you pray. And uh, we'll see you all back next week, hopefully next Wednesday night. Take care, folks.